Hey everybody, it is topic video time. Today I asked you guys what are your favorite movie scores and why, so here we go. David Shire's piano score for The Conversation is one of the most beautiful and lonely pieces of music ever. It perfectly captures the solitary nature of the protagonist spying on people for a living and riding in buses around in a city in a state of lonely guilt. I am so glad to see some love for David Shire on this list because I, I, I think he's incredible and I feel like nobody else really knows who he is. Very underrated. But yeah, I think that the conversation, I watched that at the beginning of lockdown, actually, um, for the first time in years, and I was so struck by the score, as I always am. Uh, David Shire did have a really amazing ability to capture what you say, the isolation and the guilt of the protagonist. Solo piano, and there's something about the melody that just feels a little bit off kilter, a little bit strange, and a little bit eerie, and yes, very, very lonely. And I love that David Fincher actually used David Shire to do the score for Zodiac, which makes it feel like it is kind of rooted in that Sidney Lumet, All the President's Men era, also the film school brats, because David Shire's music just reminds you of that time. And that's kind of the point of the aesthetic, just the style and everything of Zodiac to kind of harken back to those, to that era of the 70s and the film school brats. So it made all the sense in the world. I don't think it's as good as the score for the conversation, but it still captures a lot of that loneliness and that existential crisis, which is kind of key to both films. Nino Rota's Amar Court. All great filmmakers had their go-to composers to bring their visions to life, and Fellini's was Rota. I honestly don't think we'd be talking as much about Fellini's movies had it not been for Rota. Amar Court is just so full of life and something I could listen to a thousand times and not get bored with it. Yes. Uh, Nino Rota is my favorite um, film composer of all time right up there with Bernard Herrmann. I think that what you say here is so accurate in that there are just certain uh, film composers who their music is so uh, associated with the work that without it, it wouldn't be as strong. I feel that way with like a lot of Spielberg films with John Williams or George Lucas as well. Um, but with Fellini, as great as his films are, so much of what brings them to life gives it that color is what Nina Rota was able to do for him. It is one of the most brilliant collaborative teams of all time, as far as I'm concerned. I tend to gravitate more towards the early collaborations between Rota and Fellini, particularly like La Strada and Knights of Cabiria, but Rota just gets the essence of Fellini like I can't even tell you. And like with Armar Cord, yes, I think that is one of the greatest uh, scores that he ever wrote for Fellini because it embodies everything that Fellini stands for and everything that Rhoda gets about him. I mean, it's very sweeping and romantic, beautiful melody that you remember, yet there's also kind of a wit, kind of a cheekiness to it, a little wink and a smile there. There's a touch of eccentricity to it, so it's got so much in it to make it so rich. And to my knowledge, I think Armar Court is probably an underrated scorer for Nina Rota, so I'm glad that you, you brought that to people's attention. The Hateful Eight. Dramatic where it needs to be, but perfect all around. I love the fact that it was crafted by the late great Ennio Morricone to give the epic collab the just, just the right atmosphere. Um, you know, I, I, look, I'm a huge Ennio Morricone fan. He's one of my favorite composers as well. I actually wasn't that struck with the score to Hateful Eight. I think it's it's good for what it is. It's really good with building climactic tension. It does kind of fit the world, certainly, because Quentin Tarantino has just used so much of um, Ennio Morricone's music throughout his career. It's more subtle, but it lacks a lot of that dimension and that complexity of scores like, you know, like Cinema Paradiso, Once Upon a Time in America, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, the list goes on and on and on. Um, it just wasn't one of my favorites from him. I think people seem to be more struck with the idea that, oh, it's in the Morricone and he hasn't done a score in a long time. It's kind of like the Oscars. It was like, I don't know if for me, I would have picked a Morricone to win that Oscar um, for Hateful Eight, but it was more like, a, oh, well, we've never given him a, a real Oscar for a, a specific work before, so we've got to do it now. But I mean, if you like it, that's cool. Um, it's just not personally one of my favorites. I think it's a little overrated. The Third Man by Anton Karas. I found it difficult to believe that at first, director Carol Reed didn't want it in the film. Yeah, The Third Man is one of my favorite scores ever. It's ingenious. Like, who would have thought of that? To have an entire score for this, like, real, like, dark film noir to be all zither. Zither score. And what I love about this score, this is one of my favorite movies of all time. Easily my favorite film noir. And what I think is so brilliant about it is that it completely embodies everything that the movie stands for without being 
on the nose without giving you everything. Um, and that is what's so brilliant about that instrument. There's something about that jaunty kind of cheerful theme, very kind of deceptive in a lot of ways, especially when you see what's going on in the rest of the film. There's something about um, the sharpness of the, the texture of that instrument that's very um, jarring. And it does fit with the rest of the film's aesthetic in the sense that the film, it always feels a little bit off kilter. Like it's constantly using Dutch angles and using, you know, um, kind of angular lines in the compositions. And that's what the score has. It's quite complex. It's quite humorous when it needs to be, but it's also very charming and yet bitter at the same time. I, I, I love it. There Will Be Blood, Johnny Greenwood's dark and disturbing, but utterly magnificent score aids more than we can imagine to make There Will Be Blood the masterpiece of a film that it is. I believe the score perfectly captures the whole personality of Daniel Plainview as well as of the film. Yeah, I think that uh, what they were doing there was going more for like a Kubrickian sort of thing where, you know, like Kubrick used a lot of like Pendereski and Ligeti, a lot of like postmodern contemporary composers. And uh, I, I think that's just kind of what they were going for. And I think Greenwood has always been a fan of those kinds of composers so he can kind of be influenced by them and adapt it into his own style. And just like in like The Shining, we'll say, which, you know, the score does remind you a lot of, of the music from The Shining. Uh, in that film, it almost felt like the music was a separate character. And that's how this feels. Like you say that it seems to capture the whole personality of Daniel Plainville and the film. Yeah, it, it feels like a, a separate character embodying all of those characteristics while everything else has kind of a simplicity to it and a kind of a kind of a slow methodical quality to it, then there's all this like real, um, you know, like dissonant music. Extremely experimental in style and that's what I love about it, it's the textures. But I will say I think that the melodies as well, people forget to mention how haunting some of that score is. I think about the Prospector's Quartet, which plays at the end of the film, um, where a piano is featured. I, I think that's a stunning, stunning, haunting piece of music and very personal. And I think for me, There Will Be Blood, is a very emotional piece when you think about the relationship between son and father. And I think that really embodies all of that. So it's easy to dismiss Johnny Greenwood as, oh, he's the kind of experimental guy who likes to mess with textures and be kind of, but no, he can do like raw emotion and poeticism in that so well. And that's why he's my, my favorite composer currently. Ben-Hur, 1959, a few times happened that a film score truly captures the soul of the film. You know, I don't hate the score to Ben Hur. I just, maybe it's just the types of movies. I like the kind of the 1950s, very operatic gladiator movies that are also like biblical epics. I, I did enjoy those from like the 1950s, like this and the Ten Commandments. They are a little bit too melodramatic and over the top and, you know, overly sentimental. And the religious part of it does often feel like, like propaganda. And to me, the music, while I like parts of it, it's just, it's a little too heavy on the sentiment. It's a little bit too on the nose to the point where it's a little sugary sweet. You know, when you've got, when you're talking about Jesus and, and the cross and you have like a chorus of singers doing this kind of like mystical melody and a major chord, I don't know. I wish it was less bombastic. I wish it felt less like they were wringing the emotions out like it was like a damp rag and they just kind of let it be. But again, it's more the style of the film of the time. Just feels a little dated. Suspiria, 1977, the film would not be half as scary without Goblin score, combined with incredible cinematography, relying on neon primary colors as opposed to just darkness. It creates a horror experience like no other. From the weird synths to the demonic chanting, the tension it creates is palpable. You've said it beautifully here, <laughs> very eloquently. Yeah, the score to Suspiria is, is brilliant. I, I, the first time I saw it, I found it to be a little bit too abrasive. Um, but I think the more that you watch the film, you realize just how uh, important that is to the rest of the film. Because the film is supposed to have this sort of coming of age, kind of Alice in Wonderland kind of storybook quality to it. And so when the main character is, you know, coming into this place and she's very wide eyed, we need to have that feeling of like a haunted house. So yeah, having the weird kind of electronic kind of trippy quality with the, the whispering and the chants, all of that add to that witch-like uh, quality of the movie and also giving it a slightly campy feel. Enhancing all of the color around you, all the neon colors that you see in that particular film. Yes, a very, very uh, a visually arresting movie. One thing I think is brilliant about the score is how it, it kind of just switches from diegetic to non-diegetic. And what I mean by that is, is some of the music is like source music. 
you know, like, like the characters can hear it in a scene. It's a part of their world and other parts of it. It's, it's score. Like, you know, the, the characters don't know it, but we can hear it as audience members and it's constantly shifting between, wait, can they hear that? Or no, 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 they can't hear that. And all of that is really very interesting, very disorienting and adds to that tension and the suspense of it and makes it feel like there is something mystical going on. Even just the beginning of the movie when the doors open and you hear the music, they close, it stops and it keeps doing that. All that stuff is just fantastic. So yes, I think Suspiria is one of the great horror film scores of all time and worth just listening to um, just separately outside of the movie. Bernard Herrmann's score for Vertigo has always been my favorite. Scene d'Amour is so beautiful and all the whole tone stuff is cool as well. Yeah, um, Bernard Herrmann is, you know, one of my favorites as well. When I talk about Fellini and Rhoda and their collaboration, I think maybe the other great one is Alfred Hitchcock and Bernard Herrmann. They did so many great ones together and so many Herrmann scores are some of my favorites of all time, but Vertigo is my favorite. It's very, and people don't ever talk about this, but to me it's very, it's very romantic, but to the point where it's, it's just, it's almost funny. Like it's almost on the edge of farce. And I mean that in the sense that when you're watching the first half of the film, it's meant to be this kind of sugar-coated romantic story that's easing you in as though it's just some typical classical story. And then the rug gets pulled out from under you and the illusion is broken. And that's the whole point. So in the first half, it does have that beautiful romantic score and it is stunning. I mean, absolutely stunning, but it has a, a self-awareness about it. And then as you go into the second part of the film, yes, a lot of those themes still exist in the second half, but there's a, a more of a painful quality to it, more of an emotional uh, tangibility. The part where she's writing the letter and you have all of those kind of very eerie chords by the strings and she's writing to him to confess and then she throws the letter away. That is some of the most haunting, beautiful music. Like, oh my god. It, I mean, it's, it's haunting and emotional and raw to the point where it's almost uncomfortable. He really understood internal conflict, internal emotion, and how to bring that out. Um, with all these really interesting layers of instrumentation. It's just so brilliant. I, I like I don't even know what to say about it and I don't even know if it can ever be topped. I think Johnny Greenwood was very much in the spirit of Bernard Herrmann when he did the score for uh, Phantom Thread, which had you know kind of that sweeping romantic quality but then a kind of a pain underneath it, a modern quality yet still classical, yet also very self-aware and kind of cheeky um, and I, very few people can do all of that at once in such a brilliant way. But Bernard Herrmann was one of the greats and will always be remembered, as far as I'm concerned. But yes, those are some of your scores. There were so many responses to this question, so I got to see all kinds of different ones. I would have um, liked to talk about all of them, to be quite honest with you. But yeah, that is the video, you guys. Thank you so much. We'll do another one of these pretty soon. If you look here, you will see all of my Patreon supporters. The link to support that is below. All my social media information is below that as well. You can watch more videos here and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.